Go ahead and take out your Bibles this morning and turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 this morning, we are going to wrap up uh, this particular part of our series through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we, as you know, we've been breaking this down over the course, really, of the last year. We started last December, did the parts that... Uh, the introduction to the kingdom, and then picked it back up in the, in the fall, the winter and the spring, and then uh, picked it back up in the fall. And so today will be the end of this particular series uh, in Matthew's gospel. After next week, the first week of December, we'll start uh, our Christmas series that is going to be the heart of Christmas. We're doing something a little unique this year, and so I, I think you'll like it. I hope you will. I hope it will um, help to shape your life and shape your Christmas and then we'll pick back up with the next Matthew series sometime after the first of the year. Today's passage, Jesus is continuing with those words of encouragement that he gave to the twelve as he was sending them out to basically do what they had seen him do and to teach what they had heard him teach. He was sending them to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, they had been with Jesus the entire time of the Sermon on the Mount. They had been with Jesus as He came down from the mountain, beginning in Matthew chapter 8, when uh, Jesus was in and around the region of Capernaum. They had been with Him as He was teaching, as He was healing, as He was casting out demons, as He was doing all of the different things that He had done. Now, we don't know exactly how long that period was, from the start of Jesus' ministry until this particular point. But here's what we do know. Or here's what I think I know. Let me, let me put it that way. I think it had been long enough that Jesus could already tell that there was a tendency for that group of twelve to become a bubble. See, the, the reality is that all organizations, all groupings, there is a tendency to turn inward. And so Jesus knew that even in the short amount of time that he had spent with the disciples, that, that they would have been perfectly content to sit and to soak everything that Jesus could pour into them. So Jesus is, is guarding against that. And he's saying, now, I don't want you to stay in this bubble. I'm going to send you out of the bubble to teach what you've heard me teach and to do what you have seen me do. Church, can I tell you, the same danger of isolating of ourselves from the world is for us as well. We face it, and I get it. I see it. I see it even in my own life. In fact, it's almost like we program ourselves to become the bubble, and we have to consciously fight against being the bubble. I, I even think back when I went to seminary. I went to seminary in New Orleans. Can you be in a more worldly city than New Orleans? Okay, maybe you could. Maybe, maybe Amsterdam or maybe Las Vegas, but, but New Orleans is right there with it. But we lived in a bubble. We had our own little bubble there. We were cloistered with other seminary students. Even then, we're in the bubble. Then I go to my first church. Ever since my first church, I spend 90% of my time with church people. I love church people. You're my people, right? I love church people, but, but it's easy for us then to become this bubble uh, that, and we forget that God is ascending God and we are a sent people. I'm going to give us some practical next steps at the end of the message this morning for us to get outside of the bubble, but before I do, I want us to look at Jesus' closing words to the disciples as he taught them and, and, and conditioned them and prepared them for what life was going to be like when they left the bubble of the twelve of them together. You see, when we get outside the bubble, we are blessed by God. When we get outside of the bubble, we are blessed by God. Look at what Jesus had to say there in verse 32. He said, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father. I don't think it's a stretch, given the context of these words, 
to understand that acknowledging Jesus before men is a reference to getting outside of the bubble. A reference to going to the lost sheep of Israel. It's almost like Jesus is saying to them, Okay guys, I'm sending you out. I'm pushing, pushing little chicks out of the nest. I'm sending you out, and as you go out, I want you to freely acknowledge me before men. The people that you come in contact with, I want you to acknowledge that you have been with me. I want you to, to let them know about me. I want you to freely acknowledge them. Don't be timid. Don't be afraid. Acknowledge me. So let's look at some ways that we can do that. How, how do we acknowledge Jesus before men? I'm, I'm talking about for us. How, what, what are the things that we do to acknowledge Jesus before other people? Well, I believe it starts with publicly professing our faith in Jesus. It starts with us saying to the world, I am identifying with Jesus and with His church. The first act of obedience for a Christian is baptism. It's our public profession of faith. It is our first declaration that we belong to Jesus, that we are a part of His church. And so it begins with identifying with Jesus, professing our faith in Him. Once we've done that, once we've identified with Jesus and His church, we continue to acknowledge Him before people by exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. Paul talked about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. I'm not going to ask if any of you know the song about the fruit of the Spirit. Anybody want to sing it? Su Susie, are you, uh, you'd probably get one over here that would join you. <laughs> okay, well that's true. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, now, the reality is a believer who is controlled by the Spirit, a believer whose life is exhibiting that kind of character, the person's very lifestyle will acknowledge Jesus before people. If our lives are exhibiting that kind of, of character, people will see us and they'll go, she's different. There's something, there's something oddly, wonderfully different about this person. Because look around us, the world is anything but loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle and self-controlled. It's just not. Amen. So the person's very lifestyle will acknowledge Jesus before men when we walk the walk. Walking the walk and talking the talk. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Always be prepared, always be ready, to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Here's the deal. If you and I are abiding in Christ, if we are growing in grace and understanding, if our lives reflect the fruit of the Spirit, we will have opportunities. We will have opportunities to, to give an answer for why we are so different than the world. We'll have opportunities. They'll come to us. Now, we may not notice them. It's one of the practical things we'll talk about at the end of, of how we can open our eyes to see those opportunities. But when we're living our lives and we're different, when we are honest and we are kind and we are gentle and we are respectful, when we are all of those things, people are going to say, how can you be so hopeful in the midst of a hopeless world? One more thing. We acknowledge Jesus by identifying with Him in His church, exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, walking the walk and talking the talk. And we acknowledge Jesus by caring about the things that Jesus cares about. Amen. Unfortunately, in our day, this brings us into issues that are highly politicized. Those of us who care about the sanctity of life are often deemed to be right-wing extremists. Likewise, those of us who care about equality and justice are often deemed and accused of being liberal activists. But here's the truth. Jesus cares about all of that. Read the New Testament. Jesus cares about every bit of that. These are not political issues. These are gospel issues. But that's what happens when we get out of the bubble. 
We put ourselves right in the midst of, of being blessed by God and being blamed by people. We're blamed by people whose agenda is not the everyday nature of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said in verse 34, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Wait, did I read that right? Is Jesus contradicting the message of the heavenly chorus on the night of his birth, who said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased? Peace on earth? I have not come to bring peace but a sword? Here's the reality. If we get outside of the bubble, we cannot escape a certain level of conflict. When we speak truth, when we walk the walk and talk the talk, when we are living for Jesus, we are placing ourselves in the midst of a cosmic battle that has real-world ramifications. Yes, the message of the angels on that night that Jesus was born was true. Jesus came bringing peace on earth. And that peace is still available. Amen. The truth is, if Israel had accepted Jesus, He would have given them peace, but they didn't. They rejected Him. And if the world would accept Jesus, He would give us peace. But the world has rejected Him. And so that puts us on the battlefield. Conflict. Now, Jesus goes on from saying, I have not come to bring peace, but to bring a, but a sword, because he knew we'd be in the conflict. He goes on to explain that often that conflict can bring about misunderstandings even with, within the closest of our relationships. Look at what he says in verse 35. I've come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. The only way for us to escape the conflict is to stay in the bubble. Pretty tempting, isn't it? I don't know about you, I don't really like conflict. And I especially don't like conflict within those relationships that are the closest to me, within my closest friends and my family. I don't like conflict there. And so it's very tempting for us to say, you know what, I'm not going to engage. I'm going to stay in the bubble I'm going to deny Jesus before men. I'm going to deny Jesus before my family. I'm not going to walk the walk and talk the talk. I'm not going to care about the things that Jesus cared about and, and, and advocate for those things. Because this group of people might not like it or that group of people might think that I'm something different. The only way to escape the conflict is to stay in the bubble, to deny Jesus. But Jesus said, verse 37, He said, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me, follow me is not worthy of me. In other words, if we stay in the bubble, because we value our earthly relationships more than Jesus, we might escape the conflict here. The problem is that puts us in conflict with God. Amen. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. So we have a choice. We can be in conflict with the world, or we can be in conflict with God. Choose wisely. Because verse 39, he says, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. No middle ground. Warren Wiersbe wrote, If we protect our interests, we will be losers. But if we die to self and live for His interests, we will be winners. Since spiritual conflict is inevitable in this world, why not die to self and let Christ win the battle for us and in us? After all, he said, the real war is inside. Selfishness versus sacrifice. When we get outside the bubble, we are blessed by God. Often blamed by people, but don't miss this. When we get outside of the bubble, we are also a blessing to people. 
Not everyone will reject the message. Not everyone will find conflict. Verse 40 says, Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. I want to draw your attention to two words. One is receive or receives. It's used eight times in, those, in two, two of those three verses. The word reward is used three times in those three verses. See, when we get outside of the bubble, when we step into the conflict of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven, there will be people who will receive the testimony. And Jesus said, if they receive you, they receive me. And if they receive me, they receive the one who sent me. Amen. And so we can be a blessing to people. I was thinking as we were singing the song, Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood. And, and just the reality of that blessing that is ours, the blessing above all blessings, is that, that our sins have been washed away. That we are made righteous in the sight of God. That even though we are sinners, that God loves us and He desires to have a relationship with us, that He has adopted us into His family, that we are His sons and daughters. We can take that blessing to others. We, we have the opportunity as we're being His hands and feet to go out and, and to invite others into His family. And so we have to get out of the bubble. Amen. Because if we don't get out of the bubble, those, those people who could be blessed by our message, even if, even if there are those who reject it and even if there are those who, who, who desire to have conflict with us through that, if we don't get outside of the bubble, there are going to be others who will be eternally in conflict with God. But we can be a blessing. So how do we do that? How do we get ourselves outside of the bubble? What are some practical steps that we can take? Most of these that I'm about to suggest to, suggest to you are from the book, Lord, I'm Caught in the Bubble by Chuck Wallace. Start with prayer. Just start with prayer. You know, I think one of the things that, that we can do is just to confess to God our isolation. Lord, over time, I've allowed myself to get caught in this bubble. I've allowed myself, I love my church, I love my church family, I love church people, and I love being with them. And, and Lord, over time, we just kind of become a bubble. I, I'm, I'm caught in this bubble. Remind me what your word says about the great commandment and the great commission. And Lord, show me, show me the opportunities. So start with prayer. Next, enlist some prayer partners. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul asked the church at Ephesus, he said, pray for me, pray for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. But he didn't just ask the church at Ephesus to pray for him in that way. He also asked the church at Colossae to pray for him. Pray also for us, he wrote, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Think about that. If the Apostle Paul needed prayer partners to give him boldness, I'm pretty sure we do too. Truth is, I don't know that Paul really needed prayer partners. But he asked for them. Pretty sure we need that. Next, see the people in your everyday world as a mission field.
As Chuck Lawless wrote, you, don't, you do not live where you live, and you do not work where you work by accident. Even if you're not entirely content where you are, you are there to be a witness for Christ. View your context as a great commission mission field, and you'll look at everything differently. See your everyday world as your mission field. Now the truth is, it's likely there are more people in your sphere of influence who need the gospel than you think. You just haven't seen it. Because even our mindset is caught in this bubble. And we assume that everybody around us has a relationship with Christ. We assume that everyone around us is on the right road. We assume that everyone around us is a believer. But, but once we begin praying, and once we begin looking at our, our everyday world as a mission field, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal the need around us. Amen. So just three very simple things. Pray. Ask others to pray. And then just begin to open your eyes in your everyday world. And you may just have an opportunity to bring the everyday nature of the kingdom of heaven into the everyday lives of the people around you. At the end of chapter 9, before Jesus in chapter 10 is telling them, I'm sending you out to the lost sheep of Israel, Jesus told us to do this. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest. He said, the harvest is plentiful. Those people in your everyday world, there are people out there all over the place who, who need to have a relationship with me. He said, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Pray therefore earnestly to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers into his harvest. The very next section, he says to the disciples, you are the answer to that prayer. In church, I think he says the same thing to us. We are the answer to that prayer. Amen. We are the laborers that he wants to send into the harvest. Pray. Ask others to pray and look at your world differently. The harvest is plentiful. Father, I want to pray this morning for each of us in this room. God, many of us are going to spend time with extended family over the course of the next several days. Father, open our eyes to the need. Father, help us to see the world around us as you see it. Lord, we pray for opportunities. We pray for boldness. We pray for courage. But Father, I also want to pray this morning. Because it's possible that there's someone in this room or someone who is watching online who needs to take that first step of acknowledging you before men and publicly professing his or her faith in Jesus. Father, would you tug at hearts this morning and give us the boldness to respond. In Jesus' name.